So Xavier Novak is a third-year PhD student at the University of Debrecen, Hungary. Her research interests include eco-criticism, post-humanism, animal studies and affect studies. She currently focuses on the implication of the lack of empathy towards non-human entities as represented in literature, film and media. Um, so, um, uh, Sophia, you have 20 minutes as well. Uh, floor's yours. Moment. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, okay, so thank you very much for that uh, introduction. And uh, thank you for having me. Uh, so let's dive right in. So, please, O Snowman, what is toast? Inquire the children of Craig of Snowman in Margaret Atwood's Oryx and Craig. Snowman is purportedly the last human left alive after a deadly virus engineered by Craig, who is the maker of the children of Craig, drives humanity to near extinction. Resentful guardian to the genetically engineered human-animal hy hybrid species intended to inherit the planet, Snowman, known as Jimmy in the world before, unnervingly realizes that this seemingly straightforward question is virtually impossible to answer. With the Krakers having no concept, I quote, no concept of manufactured food, agriculture or technology, Snowman cannot even begin to explain what toast means. <coughs> Raising a similar problem of semantics, the dancers at the end of time opens with dialogue between the protagonist Jarek Carnelian and his mother, the Iron Orchid, pondering the meaning of the word virtuous. How do you mean my love virtuous? I'm not thoroughly sure what it means. I found the word in a dictionary, and the dictionary told me it meant acting with moral rectitude or in conformity with moral laws, good, just, righteous, bewildering. It is supposed to involve self-denial, which means doing nothing pleasurable but everything body of velvet bones of steel is pleasurable. Most of Michael Moorcock's novel takes place literally at the end of time. Here, the earth is populated by a handful of immortal and amoral post-human beings who have nothing else to do but banish boredom. Having inherited, I quote, having inherited millennia of scientific and technological knowledge, they use this wisdom to indulge their richest fantasies, to play immense imaginative games, to relax and create beautiful monstrosities. At this point, I'd like to clarify that uh, throughout my presentation, I will use the term post-human in the sense of the transhumanist ideal, as opposed to the notion of post-human defined by philosophical post-humanism. In transhumanism, which is a philosophy rooted in the Enlightenment, as is still very much anthropocentric, uh, a crucial goal is human enhancement, the ultimate result of which would be the post-human. Approached in this way, both Atwood's and Moorcock's creatures could be called post-human. The Kraker's genes are spliced with that of several animal species in order to maximize their adaptability, while the end of time's inhabitants occupy and constantly terraform their post-natural landscape uh, and possess absolute technological mastery. Critical post-humanism, or philosophical post-humanism, on the other hand, is defined by Rosie Braidotti as an anti-anthropocentrism, which I quote, criticizes species hi hierarchy and advances ecological justice, and an anti-humanism, which I quote, focuses on the critique of the humanist ideal of man, end of quote. Uh, while the tenets of critical post-humanism uh, greatly inform my reading of the novels, and I argue that to some extent the novels also aspire to perform a philosophical post-humanist critique of the societies they portray, this attempt is only partly successful. Uh, now, in both novels, uh, we encounter worlds in which a loss of meaning has occurred in several senses of the word. For one, there is a loss of meaning in the linguistic semiotic sense, understood here as stable correspondence between a word and a mental idea. On the other hand, we find a loss of meaning on a more metaphysical level, as referring to some abstract purpose or significance of life. Yet crucially, it is only the remaining human characters, Jimmy and Amelia, who, exper who experience this loss as such. Indeed, the hybrid crackers seem content with their un uncomplicated existence, filled with foraging, singing, reproducing, that is living for the sake of living. And while roaming their post-apocalyptic landscape, uh, I quote, an endless crumbling of human-made things, end quote, they sometimes come across strange artifacts, 
uh, but their curiosity is mostly easily satiated with snowman's evasive or dogma-like answers. They seem to lack the un interest or the perseverance, or both, to press him further for some deeper understanding of the past. Similarly, the dwellers at the end of time embrace their purpose-free lives. Uh, having virtually limitless power to mold their environment as they please, the favorite pastime is creation. They construct spaces inspired by their dreams or their imagination, or the tidbits of millennia of history far behind them. As opposed to the children of Craig, they take considerable interest in the heritage of the past, which occasionally becomes an obsession. For example, the protagonist Jerek develops an unceasing fascination with the 19th century. Yet just like the Krakers, who are surrounded by the incomprehensible rubble of collapsed civilization, the end of time creatures have access only to fragments of the past, which in the absence of any cultural or historical context, make no sense to them. This is illustrated by one of the minor characters, the Duke of Queen's explanation or misguided recreation of uh, 1930s New York. Are not the buildings crowded together rather, said the Iron Orchid. The Duke of Queens was not, not, not offended. Deliberately, he told her, the epics of the time made constant references to the narrowness of the streets, forcing people to move crabwise, hence the distinctive sidewalk of New York. This is why Jarek is delighted when Amelia, a native of his beloved 19th century, suddenly appears, and he hopes that she will provide him with the insight needed to handle his findings. However, their attempts at communication, similarly to Snowman's exchanges with the Krakers, fail spectacularly. Uh, missing a common frame of reference, Snowman and Amelia cannot even begin to explain the concepts that are, for them, the very simplest. Uh, their struggle highlights uh, that the, I quote, the structure of meaning in language is relational, end of quote, and suggests the extent to which discourse becomes unhinged in the textual space of these novels. Despite speaking the same language, which is English in all cases, uh, for the human and post-human characters, I quote, there is no commonality upon which to base understanding, end of quote. And their experience also seems to support literary critic Catherine Bazzi's claim that meaning is public and conventional, the result not of individual intention, but of inter-individual intelligibility. Oh, sorry. Uh, however, the novels also imply that this deterioration of meaningful discourse begins much earlier than the unfamiliar present, uh, futures they present. In both Amelia's and Jimmy's originary words, a process which reduces linguistic or cultural meaning to superficial, interchangeable tableau of templates and slogans and words to flea-floating signifiers already seems to be underway. In Oryx and Craig, uh, decisive divisions exist between number people employed by profitable biotechnological firms and thus the invaluable members of society and word people. Jimmy and his best friend Craig, a uh, future destroyer of the world, grow up in, I quote, gr grow up in a world that clearly marginalizes language and the arts so that they are merely tools of production and consumption, advertising or entertainment. Yet crucially, being a word person that is being able to manipulate language via wordplay and wit provided Jimmy with an identity. Still, even, the p even in the past, he had access merely to the surface, to the form of language, and had only a suspicion that there should be perhaps more of a depth to it. This suspicion is confirmed in his first encounter with Shakespeare, long forgotten in, uh, in the time of the novel, it seems, in his adolescence, when Jimmy is, I quote, seized by what? Something he wanted to hear, end of quote. He longs for that feeling of importance he senses in what he hears, but he cannot put uh, into words what causes his longing. His uh, controversial relationship with language continues into the post-apocalyptic era. He finds solace in language, while at the same time, he is also, I quote, plagued by it, but almost none of it is his own. Most of what he hears in his head is completely appropriated discourse, dialogism, gone amok. Still, he hangs on to the words, because they keep him grounded and because he also, I quote, develops a strangely tender feeling towards rare words as if they were children abandoned in the woods and it was his duty to rescue them. As Werke puts it, in the word, uh, in the word that Craig has created, I quote, language has become scarce in exactly the same way as material resources have, end of quote. 
For indeed, besides his hunger for a listener who would understand him, he is also tortured by a visceral kind of starvation. So Snowman works out a system of exchanges with the Krakers. He relies on them to give him food, a meal of fish once a week. In return, he nourishes the Krakers with repetitive tales he makes up about their makers, Oryx and Krake, giving them, I quote, a kind of cosmology about their existence. Since the children of Krake are vegans, and I quote, eat mostly grass and leaves and roots, end of quote, which are still growing abundantly uh, on Earth, the only hunger they know is symbolic. They crave for ethically sound stories. Oh, sorry. That's not... Yeah. Uh, while the Craker's capacity for abstraction uh, is limited at best, in Walcock's imaginary fu future, uh, where I quote, the human race had at last ceased to take itself seriously, uh, abstraction is taken so far that the end of time creature's discourse sometimes borders on the nonsensical. Their attitude towards language, however, proves hindering when it comes to Jarek's attempts at communication with his uh, Victorian love interest. So Jarek, who had never, I quote, who had never experienced anything particularly close to misery before, was beginning to understand the meaning of the word. End of quote. Jarek and Amelia's frustration at their mutual inability to understand each other seems to match Jimmy's in his dealings with the Krakers. Unlike Jimmy, however, Amelia is not tormented by physical hunger because Jarek provides her with any meal she might desire, but rather she suffers from what she perceives as the moral or spiritual impoverishment pervading the era, uh, experiencing Jarek's way of life as a mockery of existence. Still, she resolves to help Jarek by teaching him the meaning of virtue because she sees it as her duty. A sense of responsibility, which she shares with Jimmy, who becomes the reluctant keeper of the Krakers, leading them, after the collapse of civilization, from Krake's paradise fortress to the seaside forest that becomes their home. Yet, as Amelia spends more time with Jarek and becomes acclimatized to her new environment, increasingly there are, I quote, moments in her life, in this disgusting and decadent age, when she had for the first time ever sensed what freedom might mean, end of quote. Also, in spite of a promise to, I quote, explain what virtue was and Jer how Jarek might pursue it, end of quote, months pass and yet she still cannot manage a satisfactory explanation, which for the first time confronts her with the ined inadequacy of her own use of language. Her attempts consist of recounting parables, singing hymns, and decorating the walls with, I quote, pictures and motifs which read, virtue is its own reward, or what mean these stones? none of which bring Jarek closer to grasping the concept. Although Jarek tries to conform completely to her expectations, even molding their home into a perfect replica of a proper Victorian home, uh, it becomes more and more difficult for Amelia to cling to her duty for duty's sake. Seeing her civilization from a new perspective, reduced to a clutter of objects and dogmatic religious phrases and quotations, she unnervingly realizes that her whole society, the British Empire itself, unbelievable th thought that was, were not only that a million years crumbled to dust, they were forgotten. As she begins to question for the first time whether there is any, uh, truly any substance to her convictions, her sense of purpose starts to crumble, crumble to the point where she often finds it, I quote, hard to remember what duty actually was in this rotting paradise. In both Oryx and Craig and the dances at the end of time, the question of degeneration or primitiveness is central. Captured by the Victorian anxiety of degeneration, Amelia is horrified at the absolute lack of culture and sexual taboos at the end of time, where uh, the people have no problem with incest or bestiality, while marriage or monogamy is non-existent. While she admits that, I quote, it was hard indeed to cling to all one's proper moral ideas when there was so little evidence of Satan here, no war, no disease, no sadness, unless it was desired, no death even, she quickly corrects herself and identifies Satan as being present in, I quote, the sexual behavior of these people, end of quote. Interestingly, though, as time passes, she finds a way to exonerate the end of time post humans of their unseemly behavior, seeing how they are no worse, really, than those innocent children, natives of Porto Island in the South Seas, who had no conception of sin either. Uh, she compares them to a primitive, 
primitive, that is, according to Victorian beliefs, uh, to a primitive tribe, suggesting their inferiority by reinstating her own sense of superiority. Snowman, on the other hand, find the Quaker, finds the Quakers tedious and irritating due to their, I quote, naive optimism, their open friendliness, their calmness, and their limited vocabularies, uh, end of quote. The sense of the post-human conceived as pre-human is in that case especially acute, I quote, Craig's project involves both a rehumanization in a post-anthropocentric ethical sense and a selective reanimalization catapulting post-humans into a pre-human state. End of quote. Crucially, Craig edits out any propensity for art or creativity, religion and desire, which he believes would, I quote, lead to their downfall. Next, they'd be inventing idols and funerals and the afterlife and sin and kings and then slavery and war in his view. While they are hardwired for dreaming and singing, related aspects he, he could not get rid of. They are plain spoken. These people didn't go in for fancy language. They hadn't been taught evasion, euphemism, lily gilding, end of quote. Sophisticated, ingenious language is deeply missed by Snowman, however, and he particularly mourns the eradication of humor, which is a conscious effort of Craig's, because for jokes you need a certain edge, a little malice. Uh, due to their perceived naivety, uh, I quote, limited intelligence and cultural habits, end of quote, Snowman often even seems to doubt the Quaker's human status. But he must face the human condition with all its pain and uncertainty. He appears to find some consolation in still believing himself superior to the Quakers, dismissing their post-human condition as blissfully ignorant, just like Amelia does with the end-of-time creatures. However, while contrasting the human protagonists with post-human characters, the novels also subvert ideas of primitiveness, suggesting that it is a matter of perspective. While the Quaker's lack of emotional or mental complexity seems a good enough reason for Snowman to brand them as undeveloped, the scene describing Snowman's feasting on the fish proposes an entirely different viewpoint. I quote, The Quakers would never eat the fish themselves, but they've accepted Snowman's monstrousness. They know from the beginning he was a separate order of being, so they weren't surprised by this. They keep their distance and avert their eyes while he cramps handfuls of fishiness into his mouth and sucks out the eyes and cheeks, groaning with pleasure. Perhaps it's like hearing a lion gorge itself at the zoo, and like those long-gone zoo visitors, the crakers can't help peeking. The, the spectacle of depravity is of interest even to them, it seems, purified by chlorophyll, though they are. Uh, with Snowman's beastly appetized, appetites, thus contrasted with the vegan diet and ethical agenda of the Quakers who hurt no living being, his sense of superiority is powerfully undermined. A similar loss of confidence is experienced by Amelia as she is growing accustomed to the lack of moral obligations and social responsibility, the unlimited freedom that has full reign at the end of time. After a while, she even starts to wonder whether she were doing the right thing in teaching Jarek the meaning of virtue and thus trying to curtail his freedom in any way. Indeed, in a sense, the end of time is the realization of the decadent utopia, where even identities are shifting constantly. In the twilight age of humanity, there are no rules and no fixity. The members of this era constantly change who or even what they are. I quote, I'll admit that I'm thinking of going back to being a man again, and maybe a gorilla, ponders Mr. Scristia, one of the minor characters. The novel's portrayal of a post-human world, uh, which focuses on sensual pleasure and creation, on existence rather than an existential contemplation, amounts to a shift from the still-dominant logocentric and epistemologically oriented thinking towards an attitude concentrating on embodied experience and ontology. The same shift se seems to occur in Oryx and Craig's post-apocalyptic scenario as well. While structuring his post-human race, Craig focused on the abilities needed for survival and adaptability, but he also took care to snuff out any inclination towards Im imaginative thinking. His offspring are programmed, uh, I quote, are programmed to live entirely in the order of the real, untroubled by the symbolic and the imaginary orders, end of quote. Like the divine dwellers at the end of time, they don't fear death either, and they also live without any social hierarchy, any sense of property or jealousy, and are unburdened by sexual rivalry. The Quakers also only mate cyclically, 
once every, every three, three years per female, when the buttocks and abdomen of the woman in heat changed to a brew, uh, bright blue color. But Snowman notes with some sense of nostalgia and loss how, I quote, sex is no longer a mysterious right, viewed with ambivalence or downright loathing, loathing. Now it's more like an athletic demonstration, a free-spirited romp, end of quote. He is also compelled to admit it, its advantageous aspects. I quote, Since it's only the blue tissue and the pheromones released by it that stimulate the males, there's no more unrequited love these days, no more throated lust, no more prostitution, no sexual abuse of children, no sex slaves, no more rape. Indeed, the post-human approaches to sexuality seem preferable to the sexual behavior of the Victorians or Jimmy's past, characterized by toxic masculinity, the objectification, exploitation and abuse of women and in even children, thus involving a much worse sense of degeneration. In an essay, Margaret Atwood comes up with the concept of astopia and describes it as the imagined imagine perfect society and its opposite. Okay. Uh, because each contains a latent version of the other. Both the dancers and Oryx and Craig comprised of a mix, uh, are comprised of a mix of utopian and dystopian elements and could be characterized as astopias, though dystopian aspects are mostly experienced uh, only by sorry, yes, only by uh, Jimmy and Amelia, uh, for whom the futures they become stranded in are chaotic and unpredictable. Yet, becoming a quasi-prophet for the Krakers, Snowman reinterprets the pre-crisis world from a post-anthropocentric perspective for the Krakers as a chaotic circle of killing and eating animals to which the newly deified Crake and Oryx put an end, let us get rid of the chaos, installing the Great Rearrangement. Indeed, the Krakers race may also be considered the embodiment of a deep ecological ideal, uh, a philosophy propagating biocentrism instead of anthropocentrism, rejecting species hierarchy and affirming the intrinsic value of all life. Uh, Krake's progeny coexist ethically within their environment and live in harmony with what is left of nature and instead of, instead of treating it as standing reserve. Still, their, I quote, unanticipated proclivity for symbolism and their name, which monumentalizes Craig, expose his paradise project as being neither completely selfless nor successful in his quest uh, to eradicate symbolic thinking or anthropocentrism. Indeed, as I've tried to illustrate uh, throughout my presentation, although these novels uh, both approach anthropocentrism at least somewhat critically, they cannot fully escape it yet. In both, the ultimate goal remains the continuation of the human race, albeit in different, upgraded modes. While the Quaker's objective is to engineer a docile, simple race, which crucially retains a nearly perfect human form, Craig's aesthetic, and is thereby still distinguished from other animals, in the dancers, it is Jarek's father, Lord Jagged, uh, who comes up with a plan to colonize the past, as Earth is headed towards annihilation. He had made attempts to create ch a child according to Dawn Age practices. The result of uh, his experiments is Jarek, a creature of quality, the product of skill, uh, skilled craftsmanship. Jacket's idea is to take certain people from the end of time and put them at the beginning so that humanity should have billions more years ahead of it. While the post-human characters are unwilling to leave the end of time, as Jarek's mother, uh, Jarek's mother explains, it has a simplicity, which I did not find, for instance, in Amelia's Victorian age. Amelia, even as she's horrifi not horrified anymore by the era's customs and inhabitants, is keen to leave and regain her sense of moral duty in the perpetuation of the human race. She hopes that by circumventing evolution, she and Jarek might create a race almost entirely lacking in primitive instincts and without need of them, but also accomplishing, accomplishing worthwhile immortality to their children. Uh, sorry, okay. Last, I promise. In this, <laughs> in this paper, it was my intention to show that by contrasting human characters with post-human ones, the novels begin to displace the human as the ultimate point of reference and show modes of existent, existence and language use that are radically different, but by no means inferior. Thereby, they challenge both anthropocentrism and logocentrism, though they are not yet able to move completely beyond these. Still, these literary works may be read as participating in a shift from a post-structuralist epistemology towards a critical post-humanist ontology, from a focus on subjectivity and language as wordmaker to a post-human existence emphasizing embodied experience. 
Thank you for your attention.